Aloha, namaskar, and hello. This is Climate Change Beyond Outrage, and in it, we go beyond outrage to solutions for climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I am Anu Hittel, and I'm your host, broadcasting live from ThinkTech Studios in beautiful downtown Honolulu, although it does look like we're in a forest today. And our episode will be about tree snails, uh, you can tweet us live, so join this conversation while we are live by tweeting us at thinktechhi. I will read out your name and comments. And today we have with us a very special guest, very dedicated snailer, uh, David, Dr. David Sisko from Hawaii's Land and Department of Land and Natural Resources. And he is in the Snail Extinction Prevention Program. Uh, he's the coordinator of that program, which we will refer to as the SEP. Um, so, David, welcome. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. It's very nice to have you. Thank you for making it. And uh, so last week we discussed, on this, issue, on this uh, show, we discussed how seabirds uh, travel from Tasmania to the Arctic and back. So we looked at really wide-ranging animals. Today we will talk about real home bodies. Some of these tree snails never leave their tree ever. And we will talk about tree snails right here on Oahu. So uh, David, who is originally from California, has been working with these snails and he obtained his graduate degrees from UH Manoa, which is University of Hawaii Manoa. His work is focused on conservation genetics of Oahu tree snails and similar species in the Marianas Islands. And um, let me just uh, give a little, little background on just how endangered these animals are before we get David to talk more about them. So Oahu tree snails are a very endangered group of animals. Um, for one genus especially, uh, which is called Acatinella, uh, there are about 41 species of snails. Uh, and there are about uh, at least 22 of these are extinct. Um, the rest are near extinction. This genus is federally listed as endangered. It is state listed as endangered. Uh, under the uh, heritage rank, it is G1, which means critically imperiled, and under the IUCN's red list, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, their red list ranking is also critically endangered. So these are really endangered animals. Um, this entire genus, uh, consisting of 41 species, was placed on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's endangered species list uh, back in 1981. In about 1992, they wrote a recovery plan for it. And this was the first time, this was a departure from the norm. This was the first time that the Fish and Wildlife Service had uh, put a, a whole genus on the list rather than a single species. And so to address the problem of extinction, these snails, um, uh, these snails are being, um, well, there, there are projects, conservation projects around these snails that the state and federal partners have been working on. And that's, there's more to come on that. David will tell us more about it. Um, in this episode, we will look at what these little critters really, why are they so special? What do they mean to us? Uh, what are the gargantuan efforts being made <coughs> to prevent this extinction crisis? Uh, where even the army has been working on this. And we will watch a snail action video and uh, yeah, it's hard to believe, but we will watch a snail action video and then we will talk about the effects of climate change on Oahu tree snails. So Dave, why are these little critters, these little guys so special? Why, should, why do we care if they live or die? Yeah, I always, I always get asked that question and I, I was telling you earlier, I, I always um, hate when I'm introduced to new people and I have to say what I do because most people don't understand um, the background. So I really appreciate having a whole episode to, to talk about um, my passion and my, my work. And so, uh, yeah, so normally uh, the reason I dislike it is because I have to go into a lot of background So, uh, for people to understand it. So, um, Well, tell us a little background because the we diversity like to, yes. of snails in Hawaii mm -hmm. is, is something that was quite spectacular, um, scientifically speaking. Um, the Hawaiian Islands, the whole archipelago, had 750 distinct species, um, probably more that we don't even know about that are in the fossil record. So the, the diversity of snails, and I think we have a, a slide to show that. That shows has, the um, diversity, a lot of different just, just kinds of snails. Look yeah, at that, just wow. The, the diversity in form and, and color is, is pretty spectacular. And um, to give you an idea of how spectacular that is, 
Uh, we have another slide, slide two, shows the, the land mass of Hawaii versus the continental United States and, and, Central, and Central America and, and Canada. And so Hawaii is about 1 1700th the land area of, of that land, of the mainland United States, and, including Canada and, and Mexico. And we have roughly the same amount of species. So wow. in, our, in our tiny little islands are packed with that much diversity. And so that, that's pretty spectacular. Um, you mentioned they've been put on the endangered species list, so I won't elaborate on that too much. But um, aside from the, the scientific aspect about that, um, Darwin was familiar with our tree snails, and um, they helped influence his ideas on evolution and how evolution happens um, on islands where um, you perhaps don't have adaptive advantage from being in one valley versus the other. Um, so we have many species that occur um, that are endemic to single islands, that are endemic to single mountain ranges, and even endemic to single islands. I mean, single um, ridges, mountains. So single valleys. It's single even. valleys, yeah. It's so just could you talk a little more about that um, speciation, the, the different species arising from just being in those different valleys? Yeah, and so you mentioned it. You know, snails, they don't move a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And so some, some of our species, uh, individuals will spend their entire life in one tree, they won't, they won't move a whole lot. And so their capacity for movement, for active movement, is very small. Um, and, and just this separation alone, you know, th through geologic time, as the islands weather and valleys, small rivers become giant valleys, you get these, this speciation that occurs simply because um, these, these different populations on different ridges, perhaps, aren't mixing with each other. And so, and so they're very different from each other. They or they functionally, like in the ecosystem, they, they have very similar functions. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in they're, they're not that different. Um, I mean, they are different function. I'm sorry. Um, they're different in their actual genetic makeup? Yes, they're genetic. Mm -hmm. they're, very, they're, they're distinct species. Mm -hmm. yeah. and but so their function, their role in the ecosystem is very similar. It's pretty, pretty yeah, much the same. Across the island. And so we had a slide up uh, here about, I think these are some of the pictures that you've taken. Yeah, these are um, a few. Few of, few of them, and it looks like they, they like to hang out on ohia leaves. Yeah, so th these, the tree snails actually glean um, algae and fungus from the surface of leaves and branches, so they're not actually eating the plants. Uh, most people think of snail, they think of a, a garden pest, mm -hmm. and so our snails are actually cleaning the forest. They're, they're they sort of clean the yeah. leaves of this fungus yeah. and they feed off this fungus. Yeah. And of course there, are, there was a slide that we had up earlier, uh, if we could go back to that, which is the U.S. Endangered Species List, which had the different uh, species and you were mentioning how they're on different islands. So on each of these islands that we have on the, in the Hawaiian archipelago, you've got different snails and all of them seem to be, or a good chunk of them seem to be endangered. Or on yes, the and, and these listed species are by far not all of the species that are in danger of extinction. These are the, just the ones that we've had enough data, f or that, uh, not myself, but that um, those who put them on the endangered species list have had enough data to prove that they were going extinct. But um, there are many counterparts across the island that are going extinct rapidly and, and they're not listed. Okay, and so um, how big are these little guys? Um, so. We have 750 species in 10 different families, and so they range quite a lot from 2 millimeters all the way up to 25 millimeters. We even have some extinct ones that were, were almost 6 to 7 inches long. They look like a big ice cream cone. So. Oh, uh, 6 to 7 inches long? Yeah, they're very, um, very like an like a ice cream cone. So yeah. now these, these ones that we're looking at here are just different. These are about a, I would say about an inch long. You about would, an inch? Yeah. Okay. All right, and so there it looks like we've got some mountains in the background, so they obviously their habitat is now... Yeah, so, so early on in Hawaiian history, Hawaiian, the history of the Hawaiian Islands, um, the, after Polynesian occupation of the islands, a lot of the low elevation forests were denuded of a lot of vegetation, and so many species went extinct then. Um, with the onset of, of more humanity arriving on the islands and modern technology and farming. Um, there's, there's been a lot of habitat fragmentation and 
uh, a lot of the good native habitat is up high on the mountain ridges, which yeah, are, I know are that we've inaccessible areas. Yeah, that's right. And I know that we've got a couple of slides just to show you just how um, high these these ridges are and how. Yeah, we're we're talking about the very summits of the the mountains. I think uh, um, slide eight and nine have some. Some pictures. Some of those. Of look at that. So is that you? Oh, uh, that's that's a colleague. That's a colleague. Yeah. And so you're really going up on these very steep ridge tops, and sometimes you have to even fly into these areas. Yeah. Many of our areas are so remote that we we need helicopter assistant to assistance to access. So um, one reason then is the diversity of these snails. Look at those mountain tops. Beautiful. I mean, they're just. Do you really actually go up there and? Yeah. Wow. Better have some good climbing shoes. Yes, we do. Spikes. <laughs> yes, that's right. I remember when you were trying to persuade me to get up there, and, and I thought, with my Nikes, it's not going to work. <laughs> no. Right? Even, no. even with those wings on my shoes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so, um, so, so one reason is the diversity, and, that, and the fact that they are also endemic, which means that they are found only here. And They're some only of them here. Yeah, these are, this is the only place in the world. And um, our Oahu tree snails, as I said, are endemic to single mountain ranges. And that's it. They don't exist anywhere else. Um, and aside from just their, their extreme diversity and that the, scientific, the scientific aspects of, the, of their conservation, um, they, they have huge cultural ties to Hawaiian culture. Um, Hawaiians believe the snails sang in the forest. And, um, so they're the singing snail. Yeah, they were, they, their pupu kanioe is a Hawaiian word for snail, and it literally means singing shell. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the the Hawaiians have an oral tradition. They didn't have a written language, and so they they passed on information about their genealogy through chant and song. And and so the snails were the voice of the forest, and they they believed that. Um, that the snails, snails sang, and they personified that ability to pass on your genealogy. And so they were really important to hula and, um, and chant. And they're mentioned in many pieces of traditional Hawaiian poetry. Um, they're in, they're they made in lays? hula. Uh, yeah, they were very important for lei. Mm -hmm. um, lei was made, made from their shells. And I, I've been told that to have a lei, a kahuli lei, or a pupu kaneoe lei, um, was to to have the spirit of that singing snail and or, what or sort the mana. Of, what sort of um, spirit did that snail embody? A beautiful voice. Ah, okay. Yeah, and, okay. and so... Okay. Um, uh, and there are several, like at least 30 melee which have yeah, at least, at least 30 snails in them. That, yeah. that mention snails. You know, there's... Here's um, a melee. Yeah, so this, this is a, a very old um, Hawaiian chant that's been put to music in modern time, but... Um, our, our keiki, our kids in Hawaii, if they um, go to hula class, they will often perform this. It's one of the first hula that, that, um, that kids will perform. And it's supposedly uh, is the land snail singing to the kolea, asking the kolea to fetch dew from a certain fern species and bring it back to the snail. Are you going to sing the melee for us? Um, I'd rather not, but okay. if, if you would like to, <laughs> it's, it's perfectly fine. The words are right up there. I don't have my guitar or ukulele <laughs> with me, you know, next time. Yeah. 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 So, so, so we've talked about the, the diversity of the snails, the c uh, context within which uh, they were so, they're, they're so rare because they have the speciation, which I just wanted to bring it back quickly to that speciation that's slightly different from what happened with the birds, right? Because the birds came in and they sort of, it was an adaptive radiation where they spread they out. Did, they did, yeah. You know, they, into they the adapted mm -hmm. different bill shapes right. to pollinate, or right. to get nectar from certain flowers. Right. And so where the snails, it was quite different. It's, it's I guess you could call it non-adaptive species radiation. Right. And so right. they really have the same niche, right. um, wherever they are, the different species. And so. then, of course, you've got the, the very strong cultural ties. Yeah. Uh, and so it's very important in Hawaii to be conserving yeah. these little guys. So we will talk more about what the threats are to them when we come back after the break. But, but don't go away, because we will be talking about these gargantuan efforts that we're taking to preserve these tiny little critters and how the army is helping and other partners. And uh, if you stick around, we might just show you that snail action video as well. So you're watching Climate Change Beyond Outrage, and we will see you in about a minute. Hello, I'm Stephen Katz, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap, which comes to you live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on ThinkTech 
hawaii.com, and then it's repeated again whenever you want if you go to the website. On our show, we will be talking to all different kinds of therapists, psychologists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, people who talk about the mind, the brain, and about different ways to find happiness. Um, I myself am a marriage and family therapist in practice here in Hawaii, and I hope you will join us because I've got a lot to learn, you've got a lot to learn, and it's a great ride. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Hello, huh? How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Hello, ha. Aloha and welcome back to Climate Change Beyond Outrage. And here we are in the studio with our special guest, dedicated snailer, Dave Sisko. Thank you for joining us again and for that very interesting background on snails. Now we can jump right into what is actually happening with these snails. Now before we do that, I would love to see some tweets from people. Um, I will read out your name and comment. It's at thinktechhi. We're also, I'm asking a question out there every week, which is, what in your lifetime have you seen as a climate shift? Not a one-time event, but just a climate shift. Just in your lifetime, your children's lifetime, your parents' lifetime. Um, tweet that in, and I will read it out at the, at the beginning of the next segment. So um, let's talk a little bit about the threats to these little guys. It seems like they have a lot of things going against them. They do, yeah, and a lot of the different threats are synergistic in nature. And meaning so, that they play on each meaning, other? Yeah, they, one makes the other worse. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we can start kind of early on in history and, and um, they, they have a, they've had a very speedy decline um, in the past 200 years, I would say. So, so they used to be very abundant in abundant, these forests. Like it's, it's, hard, it's hard to describe how abundant they were because I, I don't think any of us have a concept right, now right. of what that would be like. But there are accounts of, of thousands of snails in, in trees. I've heard uh, one account where it's just, I don't know, this is obviously just folklore, but where they, you just pull the branch down from the tree and they, they, they just scrape yeah, off these like snails into fruits. the bucket. Yes, yeah, and uh, bucket. you know, on, on Oahu, Nu'uanu Valley, I've read used to have two miles of con of a continuous snail population in there. So must have really been paradise. It it was it must have been yeah these yeah. beautiful snails yeah. everywhere. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so over collection I so guess. So over would have collection been. yeah um, and that that probably started back in Hawaiian time when they were making lei and jewelry from them, but um, really sped up in the 1800s and 1900s. There was a collection craze, and this wasn't for lei. This was for just natural just history like, folks. Just, yeah, there was just this. They're they're beautiful and and people collected them. And Look at that diversity. There's of hundreds and thousands of shells in museums around the world from from Hawaii. Um, like this one at the Bishop Museum. Yeah, we yes. we have uh, one particular. Um, he was a naturalist, an early naturalist. He collected forty three thousand shells in in less than three years. Forty three thousand. So. Yeah, you know, these, yeah. these people, especially at the lower yeah. elevation, more accessible populations, they got cleaned out by mm -hmm. shell hunters. Yeah. Um, but, but a lot of that doesn't occur anymore, thank goodness. Um, but since the arrival of humans in the Hawaiian mm -hmm. Islands, a lot of um, non-native predators have been introduced. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you, um, on your bird episode, they talked about um, ungulates, so hoofed mammals. And so those were introduced in, in, in the Hawaiian Islands early on, pigs by the Hawaiians, and then goats by Westerners and deer. And uh, these animals destroy native vegetation. Um, they destroy the habitat and make them um, unsurvivable for a lot of these snails. Um, but perhaps more than that, worse than that are snail predators. So rats eat snails. Ah. Um, yeah, there's a picture of before and after. Oh. Um, there looks like a graveyard. Uh, yeah, and a lot of areas look like that, unfortunately. So the so rats get in there and they actually, do they just, ch they, they obviously look like they chomp down on the snail, on the they shell? They bite the apex of the shell or the large body whirl and they pull the body out and then they just discard the shell. Huh. Um, we have three species of, of introduced rat. Hawaii didn't have rats 
before. Um, one Polynesian rat that was introduced by accidentally by the Polynesians, and two um, by Western sailors: the Norwegian rat and the black rat. Um, and those are very bad predators, obviously for birds, for plants, for for snails. They're they're really wreaking havoc. Rats are a recurring theme in Hawaii. On islands. Mm -hmm across the Pacific, yeah, rats yes. are bad news. Yeah. Um, in the 1950s, the Department of Agriculture introduced a, a carnivorous snail that eats other mollusks. Uh-oh. Yeah. One of those stories. Um, this, is a, this was a, a terrible idea. Um, the islands had had an uh, introduction of giant African snails, which are a huge crop pest in the islands. And they were brought here as a food source, and I've even heard mention that uh, they were spread around the islands because people liked the way they looked in their yards, but they soon reached plague proportions, and so um, folks were desperate to try and get rid of these because they were eating crops. And so they, they brought in all kinds of invasive species that eat mollusks, and this one stuck. And unfortunately, doesn't have very much impact on the giant mm -hmm. African snail, but is um, decimating our, our native snail fauna. Uh, so let's take a look at that rosy wolf snail. Yeah, which is the, the one common name is rosy wolf snail, yeah, and the, yeah. the scientific name is Euglandina rosea, and it's from the southern continental United States. So I think s we have a slide of the rosy wolf snail. Yeah, we have slide a fifteen. But um, there it is. Look at that. It's uh, that is the rosy wolf snail. Yeah, right? that's the rosy yes. wolf snail. Very different looking from our little native. They're different. They're fast, and they actually track the slime of of snails, and they know the direction the slime was laid down, and they they track it and yeah. they eat it. Yeah. And so we'll watch a video, not of it tracking down our precious little kahuli here, but but of tracking down another snail, and yes. we'll just we'll see that in a second here. But how much bigger are these guys? They're probably ten times bigger than a lot. Ten alive. times. Yeah, they're 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 big. They're big and they're they're fast. They grow fast and they reproduce quickly. So they're they're design. They're hunters. They're the wolves of the mollusk world. So so here it is. So it's uh, give it a play by play. Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah. So, so these they, they have a lot of um, sensory receptors in the front of their face and they can they can track slime like I mentioned and and studies have shown that they even know the direction that the slime was laid down. So they're they're very good at at hunting their for their prey. Um, they're perhaps worse than any other predator because they're strictly a mollusk predator, whereas rats are sort of generalists that are eating everything. So this one goes specifically other, uh, after other, other mollusks. Other mollusks, yeah. And so that's the little guy, not our little guy, but that's another one invasive of the other. species. It's another invasive, okay. So that's okay that it's going after this one. Yeah, in the video. it can eat this one. Okay. okay. <laughs> but now, oh my God, is that its face? If snails yeah. have faces, I don't know, do they? <laughs> so it's leaving a tr slime trail behind, and this one is just sort of sniffing out the slime yeah, trail? Yeah, you can tell it's excited. It, it's definitely sensed the presence of another mollusk, and it's, um, it's going to go after it. This video is terrifying, by the way. It's a perfect horror movie, isn't it? Look at that. And so it's going after the little guy, and oop. Oh my god, it just goes right in there. Yeah, so small snails, they will just swallow whole, and larger snails, they, they use oh. this proboscis that they have. That's, it's, it's basically a modified radula, which is the tongue that all snails have. Our kahuli use it to scrape algae. These, it's modified to, to be Stab. inserted into a shell and, and just rip and tear. Yeah, so they pretty much just vacuum. Wow, that was... Snail right out of their shell. That's some pretty exciting... Uh, hmm. Wow, and that's, uh, yeah, that's from uh, Rob Nelson's video, and um, it's, uh, it's wonderful that we are able to use it. So, yeah, so uh, this is the kind of action that's going on yeah. out there for our little snails. I should mention also that Jackson's chameleons have been introduced in the, the past 20 years or so, and they're from Kenya, and they were introduced through the exotic pet trade, and um, they're, they're decimating mm. invertebrate pop populations across the islands, including snail, and, and um, they're on every Hawaiian island up in the highest uh, forest oh. reserves. What are they here for? What, why did they come here? They were brought here because as pets, people thought or? they were interesting as pets, yeah. And Which they are, When but people get tired of them, unfortunately, I think they unknowingly release them into the forest. And, um, so that is something not to do, which is if you have a Jackson's chameleon, don't please release don't release it no. into the wild. Please take it to... You could take it to a pet store, or you could humanely um, dispatch it. 
How do you humanely dispatch Jackson's Camille? You could chameleon? put it in the freezer. They're cold-blooded, so it's... Oh, so they'll just go to they sleep. They will go to sleep. Okay, so people out there with Jackson's Chameleons, please put just the put them in the freezer if you don't want them anymore. Please yes. don't send them out there to eat our little snails, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we've got a lot of threats to these little guys. Um, there is, of course, the overarching threat, which we will talk in more detail about later, but that's the uh, perhaps even worse than the rosy wolf snail, and that's the climate change threat, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. But to address all of these threats, that's one of the reasons that the sta Snail Extinction Prevention Program, yeah. the SEP program, was... So uh, um, conservation efforts have been going on for a long time with different um, university professors. And as mitigation, um, as you mentioned, the Army participates in snail conservation for, um, to mitigate for damages that some of their bases do to forested areas. And so they, they put a lot of effort towards saving um, snails. But these were all... Um, they were very land specific mm -hmm. or species sp specific and there was never really an overarching program or effort that, to target um, this extinction crisis on a larger scale. And so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in partnership with the Department of Land and Natural Resources in Hawaii developed um, our program, the Snail Extinction Prevention Program, to start addressing um, these issues mm -hmm. and preventing some of these st uh, species from going extinct and coordinating efforts with um, all of our different partners. And we have many different partners um, across the islands that enable us to do our work, including the Army that you, that you suggest. Right, and so it's at, yeah. the, um, at the federal level as well as at the state level, yeah. and then you've got re researchers at UH and other places. partnerships with UH and mm -hmm. with different um, landholders, um, which they go from allowing us access to all the way up to providing manpower and funding for certain projects. So, yeah. so, um, th so in other words, um, we could also be looking uh, probably at, uh, well, you mentioned something about the Army, and, and you said yeah. that that's one of your partners, and we had talked about that over lunch, so that's something um, maybe we could take a look at what the Army has been doing yeah, as so part of this, which is... So the Army, in partnerships with other groups as well, have um, developed some amazing uh, predator exclusion technology, um, which we're implementing in other areas that the Army doesn't manage to manage other species. And so um, for the past 20 years, the most effective way to conserve some of these snails from predators is to use uh, predator-proof fencing. And this is a great shot of one of them. Um, they have three um, euglandina barriers and so euglandina is that's this is the rosy the wolf rosy snail wolf, yeah so sorry this, about that so the ro rosy wolf snail can't get through they can't these. get in there so there's a angle flange that's on the bottom so basically the the snail gets stuck under the angle and, it, and the rosy wolf snail can't maneuver and get around and if they get around that there's a a platform with spikes that that point down and it, it they don't allow the the rosy wolf snail to get a purchase, and so the gravity helps and they fall down. But if they get over that, we electrocute them. Um, so we have <laughs> okay, so electrical <laughs> wires that, that run. So, so a lot of effort to keep these okay. things out of ha habitat. Yes, and this is this was designed by um, the Army? Yeah, the, Ar the Oahu Army Natural Resources That's Program. That's perfect. Yeah, there. <laughs> it's a great way to employ our... Uh, our tax money through through Department of Defense <laughs> yes, in, in the defense of snails, of snails yeah. against the rosy wolf snail. So these, these, um, these fences are very effective. Obviously, it's very hard to clear habitat once you fence it to make sure it's to rid it of predators. Right. That, that takes a lot of effort. But once it is predator free, um, the snails do very well inside the native snail populations rebound. This is another shot from um, an exclosure structure in the Ko'ola Mountains on Oahu. Okay, so these are again up at the ridge tops because that's these where these uh, snails are, right and up that's on where the you summits. want to. Yeah, yeah, so, so you've got these big walls essentially that you're building. Yep. Um, the I remember when I was doing a little little work on this, they they were referred to fondly as snail jails. I like to call them <laughs> a snail village. This, you know what? It, it actually doesn't keep snails in; it keeps things out. So. Um, yeah, they can uh, leave anytime they want. They, they just can won't leave, be able to get back. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So uh, they can always leave, but maybe never come back. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of the opposite village. of a roach motel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we don't want to. We, uh, yeah, we don't, don't want to equate them with. with yeah, that's snail. right. Now here's another one which looks so, different. So this is for um, a ground dwelling snail, and this is really interesting because um, what we do is we we put a core group of breeding adults inside here, and the babies can leave. They're small enough to leave, so it excludes all predators. Um, and it's a way to establish, re-establish populations or, or keep populations persisting because you, call, you constantly have a protected group of breeding adults and the, 
the young juvenile snails can exit, exit okay. the cage and, and keep a population functioning or, or um, yeah, that's yeah. sort of the opposite of what exactly. one would do in a human family, which is, you know, you want to keep the babies inside <laughs> yes, and the grown-ups exactly. go outside. So, so we're using various techniques so to, depending on the terrain and if, if we can build an exclosure or not, um, we, we're using there, different techniques. There is one where we have just a tree exclosure, right? Yeah, that's this, your this one protects the last seven Acatonella fuscobasis that we know exist in the world today. Acatonella, so, so that's your little snail this, over there. This, uh, yeah, that's the species of snail, and it occurred in the southern Koala mountains probably um, right up into Honolulu area this would have would have been a common snail and it now has has seven individuals just left. seven of these seven yeah in all the world and in the whole world and so it's around this one tree and you've got a so this 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 particular cage so they live on these big trunks of these big trees and so they're they just get gobbled up by the predator the predator load where they're still persisting is extremely high and so we've built these um, single tree cages to protect them, and they're doing well, and they're making babies inside. So. Oh, wonderful! So well, this is this is a very stopgap measure. Yes, we're of trying course. to keep things from going extinct. Very yeah, extreme. Not a long term. And we'll strategy. talk about this captive rearing, and uh, we actually how we get into get those snails into the wild, and so on, uh, when we come back from the break. But again, if you want to tweet us something or let us know in your lifetime any sort of climate shift that has happened, I will read that out in the next segment. This is Climate Change Beyond Outrage, and don't go anywhere, well, go somewhere, but come back in a minute, and we'll be with you. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Aloha. You can join the Hawaii Farmer Series every Thursday from 4 to 5 on ThinkTech. And I'm your co-host, Matthew Johnson, here with Justine Espirito. And we are so thankful to have this show to use as a forum to get to know all the movers and shakers in agriculture in Hawaii and hear kind of their background in history as well as... Uh, their perspective on what they're doing and also the future for agriculture in Hawaii. So join us every Thursday. You can tweet in your own comments and suggestions and be a part of the conversation at Think Tech High. And we hope to see you every single Thursday. We'll be fast. Aloha and welcome back to Climate Change Beyond Outrage, where we are with Dave Sisko from the sta Snail Extinction Prevention Program, Department of Land and Natural Resources. And we're talking about how do you uh, work with all of these different predators and threats and climate change effects uh, to preserve the highly endangered fauna um, of Hawaii, specifically tree snails of Oahu. So uh, we were just talking about uh, exclosures and building these fences essentially so that predators cannot get in to eat these snails and now let's also talk a little bit about some of the efforts on uh, how to what's going on with their um, uh, actually raising snails in captivity mm -hmm. uh, much like zoos I suppose and then bringing them back out into the wild yeah so there's there have been um, ongoing efforts at the University of Hawaii for the past 20 years um, rearing rare snails and learning how to rear rare, rare snails. And so there's a, there's a captive rearing laboratory at the University of Hawaii that we work closely with who um, rear some of our rarest snails. And um, those, are, those are for um, reintroduction to the wild into protected areas. So I'm seeing a lot of fridges and... Yeah, so we rear them in environmental chambers and they, they mimic the climate conditions uh, that the snails would experience naturally in the wild. So they control for um, temperature and humidity and the snails get misted. Um, periodically as as they would naturally in the wild um, mm -hmm. with passing clouds um, and they get fed a diet of um, they, the, the laboratory personnel cultivate um, fungal species from the areas where the snails are from and they grow those on auger plates and they feed the snails that and they also get fresh fresh vegetation to graze on do they get fresh ohia leaves they do so yes. it's like their little salad yeah very much yeah yeah, yeah. wonderful and, 
Yeah, so so I don't feel so sorry for them sitting in refrigerators in a UH no, lab and somewhere. No, no, don't feel sorry. For them. <laughs> and and many of them will go back out into the wild. So it's it's a good effort. Right, and so then um, tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, so this is a technique. Um, mm -hmm. One of my colleagues developed it um, in our program actually, and uh, it uses um, what is this photo recognition software developed for zebras and leopards. And it works on snails. And so um, this is allowing us to use capture mark recapture techniques, which is a, which are um, a technique for estimating population size. So snails are sometimes hard to find. And so you'll never find all of them in a population. So taking a census is very hard. So we have to have other means to measure population size. And so this allows us to, to estimate population size and also keep track of individual snails through time without actually having to put any mark on the snail at all which can endanger it. Um, right. Yeah, so. How do you find them? Oh, we actually get out there and, <laughs> and look. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we look at night. We spotlight It's easier them. to find them at night? Yeah, we, we usually see about 50% more at night. And we use um, high-powered spotlights, and we spotlight for them. Their shells, um, they're pretty glossy, and so they, they shine differently in the light than the ah. leaves, and so they're much easier to see during the night. Okay. And wow, who would have thunk it, huh? Yeah. So, um, so this is really interesting, and let me, let me you know, shift a little bit into our um, other segment about climate change and what impact it's having on these snails. And just before we get into that, I quickly wanted to mention that uh, I'm, I'm doing this sort of series every week asking people what shifts have they seen even within their lifetimes. Now, that is very anecdotal. It's not data. Uh, the plural of anecdote is not data, so we're not doing that. But what we're doing is just getting, encouraging people to look in the longer term, to look at their surroundings, to, to take note of what's happening, the changes. And we know, for example, uh, my parents who live in New Delhi, they have said that they used to have this annual picnic in February outside every year, and they can't anymore because it's just too cold. And that's, so that's changed, and the air is too polluted. So that's one thing that's changed for them. But that's happened over the last several years, um, just asking people for that. So one other, uh, one other story that I had like that or anecdote was Amanda from the United Kingdom says that there are these, uh, it's always been wet there, of course, but it's wetter there in the winters now than it ever was before. And there's actually standing water in the fields. And of course, these changes, Will these things will change how uh, the flora and the fauna react, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And that is exactly what you're sort of thinking will happen with the snails. There will be some effect of climate change, of temperature, rainfall, seasonality, all of those variations. And so I understand you've been doing some work around that. Yeah, we've partnered with the University of Hawaii and again the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on a, a study to uh, predict climate change impacts on snail populations so that we can identify populations that are vulnerable to climate change and start planning what to do for these populations well ahead of, of when we would need to act. So okay, and so what kinds, of, uh, what kinds of things do you have, things you've already found? I know that we have some. Yeah, so I, I have some preliminary data to show you today. And I think the, the first several slides are just showing the climatic conditions that we use to model snail distribution. Okay. Um, and so w what we did is we, we, we looked at where snails occur now and uh, I'm not a modeling expert, but the, but the scientists who are studying this. Um, are they at, at the university? They're at university and, and uh -huh. at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They okay. have a modeling expert there. And so what, what they did is they, they've, they tested a variety of variables and found four variables that accurately predict the current distribution of where snails now, is okay. this the effort with, uh, is it Lucas Fortini or um, is other folks similar? Same team. Same yeah, team. That's yes, because they've been, we've had some other episodes where for the forest birds, they've done vulnerability yeah. assessments. And I know that they've done that for plants as yeah. well. So this is an effort that's happening so in, on, right. On so, this, if, so. If, so that mean uh, annual temperature range graph that so was basically, if we could go back to that for a second. So there's, there's four climatic variables that, that accurately predict um, where snails occur now, okay, so, so that we could predict into the future where they'll be. And so the, the four were mean annual temperature range. Um, the so next wait, one so, so this is really showing you what's the green and the, you know, the, it's just showing you the temperature gradient? The temperature gradient, yeah, and you can see the, the ridges are, are much cooler, cooler than, right. the, than the 
eastern yeah. part of the island. Okay, yeah. so then the next one is the mean... Mean temperature of the wettest quarter. So when it's the wettest... With, what is the temperature, the temperature when temperature? it's the wettest? Okay, so you've got a little bit of a uh, warmer yep. on the ridges there. Yeah. So it's warmer than the rest of the... Well, actually, that might be inverted. That might actually be cooler. That's supposed to be cooler. Yeah. Okay, so it really Sorry. should be cooler. Yeah. Okay, and so then... So the summits are cooler. So the summits are again cooler. Then you're looking at the precipitation of the wettest month, which is the next... That's correct, yeah. So how much rain in the wettest month, which is usually in the winter in Hawaii. Okay, so you're not getting that much rain up in the mountains, yeah, are so you? Yeah, so the, the little square is focusing on, a, on the Waianae Mountain Range on Oahu. And this, for this particular example, um, we have a species that occurs um, throughout the Waianae Mountain Range. Okay. I should have prefaced with that. Okay. And then we're looking at also, the next slide is precipitation and seasonality. seasonality. So how much seasonality is there in precipitation? How much difference between summer and winter? Okay. And so that, uh, those, those variables combined accurately predict where tree snails occur now. And, and by using those variables and applying um, climate change models, we can predict where they will likely be in the future or where their uh, range, suitable okay. habitat will be in the future. So you combine all of this information, then we get that. Very complex models. Uh, with, yes, yes. <laughs> it's I not as simple as just combining. No, no, and then, no. you get, um, then you get this, the next A slide, which is distribution. the... So on the left, we have the, the current distribution of Acatinella mustelina, which is a, a tree snail species, as I mentioned, that occurs throughout the Waianae Mountains. And this, is, this modeled its range almost to a T, where it occurs now. Okay. And um, green represents perfect habitat, good habitat for the snails. Blue is marginal, but still habitable. So if you look at the projected for, two, for uh, 2080, mm -hmm. you can see that their, their range drastically decreases. And the only green habitat occurs on Mount Ka'ala, which is the highest mountain mm -hmm. on the island of Oahu. So their, their range almost disappears, dries up and disappears. So we're looking into the next into the next several decades that we will really, the projected range has diminished so much. Yeah. And there really won't be, a, that place won't be the right place for them, but there might be other places. There might be other places. The, the silver lining to that is other areas will open up that mm -hmm. perhaps aren't suitable right now for this species. Okay. Um, but it won't be within its historical range. So we're kind of talking about something that, that has been debated a lot recently, mm -hmm. which is moving animals, assisted colonization, if you will, right. to uh, more suitable habitat, even if they didn't occur there in, in right. their entire history. So humans are not going to be the only climate refugees. No. It's no. going to be snails. a lot of plants, snails, snails, yes, snails with their little houses. Yes, and um, I should mention that climate change will, will not just impact the habitat, but it, it impacts invasive species as well. And so when the habitat changes so drastically, it dries up. You, you provide this ideal conditions for weeds and, and other predators to enter into the native forest. And so it's really the synergistic, mm -hmm. very complicated problem and climate change is overarching all of that. Yes, and so there is also, uh, we, we did get a tweet in and I'm going to, I'm going to read uh -oh. it out in just a minute. Okay. But um, I just wanted to mention that, so we're, we're doing this range of efforts here. Uh, it's a huge effort really when you look at it for, for, for a few species, but we need to do that because otherwise we lose our link to those species, to the past, to perhaps the future, and to be able to hand down that past to our, to our future, essentially, right? Correct, now, yeah. our tweet here is from uh, High Living 808 and it says, David, how did you get into this field and did you collect snails as a kid? So real briefly, tell us yeah, how you got so, into snails. Um, I, when I was an undergraduate, I um, got into a program that allowed you to have an internship at a university of your choosing or a, a research facility of your choosing. So my, I had a stipend that went with me pretty much wherever I went so I could go anywhere. And I had um, an advisor that knew um, a professor in Hawaii and so I was connected and I came out here and I actually worked on um, or ocean organisms, some uh, invertebrates in the ocean. And um, while I was there I also got to go out into the field with this professor who also well, works with tree snails and I, I just kind of fell in love with the snails. They were, they were really fascinating and beautiful and um, 
I just was really interested, and so I applied for grad school and came back and worked on the snails. And what's not to love about these wonderful creatures? So thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise and for continuing to do this work and to all the partners that are working on this issue as well. Uh, and to all of you out there, um, you know, keep those snails in mind. Know that that's what's going on, that there are efforts to save them that we are trying to work with the smallest of organisms to the largest and that that's the, the problem that climate change will pose to all of us. So with that I will close and hope to see you next week at this time on Climate Change Beyond Outrage Tuesday at one o'clock with Anu Hitol. Aloha, namaskar and goodbye. <laughs>